the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make is they get a shot. They get a shot at pitching for money. There's, you know, a, a typical inter, uh, a venture capitalist would probably see, you know, a thousand deals a year, most, uh, on paper. And, but he will only have time to really talk to a hundred of those thousand deals. So, so the fact that you're being invited to a meeting, you've already made a phenomenal cut. The investment presentation is crucial to, to raising money. You have to understand that venture capitalists might see, oh, a hundred presentations in a month, and their eyes can get really uh, dreary looking after a while. So the presentation has to be short, and it has to be succinct, and it has to be um, exciting to them. Um, the, the presenter uh, should use any type of uh, multimedia uh, that they can to get the excitement up. They have to understand what they're presenting and understand what the investors want to see or want to hear. Um, and at the end of the presentation, um, they should be able to ask for the order. You have to have these six questions answered, right? The pain, uh, your, your solution to that pain, the size of that market, the management team, the competitive advantages, and then the business model and, and the financials. Uh, key points of, a, of what's the content of a first meeting with a venture capitalist. First of all, that meeting usually takes an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, we want to get a clear understanding of what your product is, what market you're addressing, what problems you solve, um, challenges you have in putting together uh, and ramping the business, and a good fin initial financial review of your burn for the first 12 to 18 to 24 months of the company. You have to be very uh, open-minded uh, to be not defensive but to actually be vulnerable if you will and put yourself out there to answer the questions that they have and sometimes the best answer is to actually say I don't know. A bad presentation from the investment committee is one where the entrepreneur doesn't answer the question. If he or she doesn't know the answer to the question then a perfectly acceptable answer is I don't know but we from the VC side don't hear that often enough. Uh, another characteristic of a bad presentation is one that's all one way. If it's just the entrepreneur talking to us for, in a complete diarrhea of the mouth for 20 minutes and there's no two way, there's no dialogue, that's not a very useful meeting. First clear meeting, uh, the purpose of that meeting is to get a second meeting. Your philosophy coming into a, on a VC should be, how do I get my second meeting? A good presentation is one that's more of a give and take, really more of a two-way dialogue. A good presentation answers the VC's questions. If it doesn't answer the questions, it maybe helps us think about the question, rewording the question, or a good answer, if you don't know, is, I don't know, let me get back to whatever resource, and I'll get back to you in 24 hours with that answer. During the presentation, um, a, a typical presentation might last 20 to 30 minutes in the presenting part. And the presenter, um, usually the CEO of the startup company, should be prepared to stay another half hour to an hour with the venture capitalist answering uh, very difficult questions. A good presentation uh, is flexible and by that I mean if you've brought in 50 slides 15 of them are about product development and it's clear that we're not interested in product development you can just skip those 15 slides and move on to the three that you do have about your management team or something that we appear to be interested in. If an entrepreneur starts a meeting by asking us to sign an NDA we just don't take the meeting. We see far too many deals it's far too hard to separate whose idea was what and by the way, if the NDA is the only thing protecting the idea in the marketplace, it's probably not going to be a good venture investment. That's not to say it wouldn't be a good business, but it's probably not a differentiable or defendable enough business for, an, for a venture capital firm to invest in. Most VCs do not sign non-disclosures. And uh, one of the key reasons um, is, is it, this is our reputation. Uh, I don't know if I've ever read where a VC has, quote, stolen an idea. 
Uh, that's our reputation. If, if it was ever in, in Austin or in Denver where we do most of our deal flow, if uh, we ever violated a trust, um, it, would, you know, it would be the end of our fund. The only main reasons that I would say you would say no to money would be the terms of the money uh, and the source of the money. Um, it could be that you know you change your mind perhaps through your due diligence or you discover something about the venture capitalist in particular or the firm that he represents or it could be the fact that you know the negotiations and the terms uh, have evolved into something that it's something really that you cannot live with. In essence the terms that a VC is looking for is to A protect their investment and B they're trying to make as much money as humanly possible in the shortest time frame possible. So if you need the money and it's the right amount of money and you're pretty confident you're going to get what you need to, to have happen then the terms are usually not an issue. But things I would look for are anything to do with what are called toxic securities, which means ratchet clauses, doubling down clauses, uh, anti-dilution protection so that if you run out of money and you have to finance again, the person who put up the money originally gets protected so all of the dilution falls on the management's uh, head. This is something that's become very common in the last couple of years since the recession and since the meltdown in the venture capital community. So that is something that's very, very difficult to take a couple of years later, especially if you're just at the point of reaching commercial success and you have uh, given some toxic security uh, provisions out previously and they come back and bite the uh, financial uh, uh, situation pretty hard. Other than that, board representation and all the other things, they're pretty standard. Hire yourself a good lawyer and you shouldn't have any problems. I cannot emphasize how important it is to spend an incredible amount of time on making sure that you have the right valuation. Well, valuation is uh, maybe one of the more difficult terms in venture capital. Uh, it, it ties to what we feel the, the value of the company is and the, and the management team feels the value of the company is. Usually a two-way street. Uh, we, have, we want agreement on valuation um, among the, vent, the investors and the management team. Um, it can range. There's sometimes uh, comparables where you can look at comparable companies and in their development what their uh, valuations were. Uh, sometimes it's more of a, if it's a very, very early company, it's more of just being fair all the way around to the investors and the, uh, and the founders. One of the things you have to be careful of is to ensure that you know, the, the, the time period to even consider the investment in your company gives you enough time to consider multiple opportunities. The biggest thing you need to be aware of when you receive money from a venture capitalist or an angel it really has to do with what's called the preferred shares they're buying and the terms and conditions of those shares. So the biggest thing to look for is liquidation clauses. So anybody who tells you that they need to have more than one time the investment that they put in as a liquidation clause, it's really taking what it's called a pound of flesh. Uh, some venture capitalists are as honorous of asking things like three times, six times, ten times return of investment. Which means that if they invested a dollar in your company, and your company is worth five or maybe seven and at some point it gets purchased by ten but if they had a clause that says they need to get they get ten times their money when any event happens then they get the entire ten dollars and you get nothing and you just work for them and that would be you know sort of capitalism to the far right if you deal with an awful lot of uh, traditional venture capitalists they will dilute you down to say percent seventy percent of the business uh, they will also have a requirement that the next 20 to 25 or next 20 percent of the business is set aside uh, for management and for a stock option pool, thus leaving the founders with about 5 percent of the business. So dilution is a major issue. Pretty standard, uh, especially in first round deals. There's a valuation, there's the amount of money that uh, the venture capitalists uh, um, you know, will invest. There are sometimes milestones in, in, in term sheets 
where we specify that we will invest X dollars uh, when certain milestones are achieved by the management team. Um, there are just some basic setup of uh, preferred uh, stock. Uh, we usually work with preferred stock and gives us a preferred position. There's board seat act, there's board seat um, uh, sort of uh, confirmation. Sometimes there's observation rights uh, to the board. And what it is, again, pretty standard uh, from one deal to the next when you're talking about first round investment. Uh, the other thing would be, in particular, any, any kind of termination clause that has to do with the founders, their shares, uh, or the management team. Anything that would uh, could potentially harm upon the receipt of the money uh, to take uh, the you know and shift the dramatic structure of the team or the founding team or the key members of the team. My best counsel is to get good counsel, um, and uh, we uh, it makes the process I think go much smoother. Time frame once you pass all the criteria is, is really difficult to estimate. It really depends on whether you pass with or without due diligence. It's not unusual for a term sheet to be issued subject to due, due, to due diligence. But the process usually takes, uh, boy, three, four, maybe five months. Frequently I've seen it's the entrepreneurs uh, sort of negotiating that usually slows it down. Most venture firms have a standard form of agreement they're going to use and it's probably best not to let the entrepreneur or the attorney for the entrepreneur get too wrapped up in the details because in the end the person who has the money is probably going to set the terms. So my advice is agree to the business terms up front and then if you agree to the business terms on the front end, negotiating the details and figuring out how to turn that into legal paperwork is fairly straightforward. Typical time frame required to uh, acquire funding in a company is dependent again on the level of funding and where you are in the maturation of your company. As a seed stage company, uh, you may find that you're able to acquire funding within 60 to 90 days through a uh, network of angel investors and potentially through other uh, means, venture capitalists, et cetera. Um, typically though, acquisition of funding requires between six months and a year. Most venture capital firms uh, will begin talking, require evidence, go through your business plan, a series of meetings, and a very quick turnaround through a venture capital group would be six to nine months.